I'd like to call this meeting uh, the Board of Supervisors to order, please. The first item on the agenda is an addendum to our closed meeting, and that's discussion of Old Blacksburg Middle School property. A motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Curry's? Aye. Chair uh, <laughs> and the next item is our, uh, I need a motion to go into closed meeting. Second. Been moved and seconded. And the closed meeting is, uh, first we need to accept the addendum. It would just be added as if it's not there already. You would just say it. Okay. Well, it says it, the the first thing, the uh, discussion of uh, property and yeah. acquisition All right. or buying or uh, acquisition or selling the property. All right. Discussion and consideration or acquisition of real property for public purpose or the disposition of public publicly held property <clears throat> where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiation strategy of the public body. And that is the Elliston Lafayette Industrial Park and, and, Old and Old Blacksburg Middle School. And the uh, second item, this is 2.2-3711-1, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salary, disciplining, or resignation of specific officers, appointees, or employees of the public body. And that is for the uh, AFD Advisory Committee and for Parks and Rec. Mr. Cree? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Chair Lettuce? Aye. 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 And we're now in a closed meeting. All right. Hey, dear. I'd let my attorney go. I'd like to call uh, this meeting of the Board of Supervisors back to order, please. The first Item is to uh, go out of closed meeting. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Ms. Hi. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. Biggs. Aye. Mr. Tuck. Aye. Mr. Morita. Aye. Chair Lettuce. Aye. Aye. The next item is certification of the closed meeting, whereas the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to the affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the board of such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County, Virginia, hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from meeting requirements by the <coughs> Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies. And only public business matters as were identified in the motion conveying the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Green? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Chair Williams? Aye. Aye. Six ayes. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our invocation, and that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If everybody will please rise and consider the things that we have before us tonight. Let us pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is a presentation, and it's a uh, 
Resolution of recognition for Donald, Donald Tedora for his pub, from the Public Service Authority. And at this time, I want to turn over the process to Mr. Creed, who's our chairman of the PSA. Okay, I'm wondering if we want to go down there now or wait until we read this and then I'll meet down and present it to him at that time. I think if you read it, Gary, the mic is, would do yeah. a good okay. job up here first. Okay, it is my pleasure to read this recognition of Mr. Tedora. It's an accomplishment that uh, few in the water service of counties and states and worlds don't get usually in their lifetime of working. So this is something that I think is really very exemplary of Mr. Tedora's hard work and ethics as he strives to make this county the best that it can be. And it says, at a regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors of the, of the County of Montgomery, Virginia, held on the 13th day of May, 2013, at 6 p.m. in the Board Chambers, Montgomery County Government Center, Roanoke Street, Christiansburg, Virginia. It's a resolution of recognition, Donald D. Tadora. Whereas Donald D. Tadora has been an employee of the Montgomery County Public Service Authority for more than 25 years and has supervised Montgomery County Public Service Authority water operations for nearly 20 years. And whereas Donald E. Tadora has transformed the Montgomery County Public Service Authority water operations into a well-coordinated system that currently has less than 10% water loss and an overall permits compliance and has received compliments for Montgomery County Public Service Authority water systems operation from Virginia Department of Health inspectors for at least the last three years. And whereas Don developed and supervised sampling schedules for all Montgomery County Public Service Authority water systems has developed a cost-effective leak detection program that has reduced water loss of over 25%, from over 25% to under 10%, and coordinates the conducts, coordinates and conducts all Montgomery County Public Service Authority training programs, and whereas Don can always be counted upon to assist in any Montgomery County Public Service Authority water operation at any time. His dedication to Montgomery County Public Service Authority water operations has made it a success that it is today. And whereas the Virginia Rural Water Association has recently named Donald D. Tadora the 2012 VRWA Water Systems Operator of the year. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County, Virginia, that the Board of Supervisors congratulates Donald D. Tadora for recognition from the VRWA by naming him the 2012 VRWA Water Systems Operator of the Year. Be it further resolved that the original of this resolution be presented to Donald D. Tadora and a copy be made a part of the office official minutes of Montgomery County. That is one, and we have another that is from the Virginia Rural Water Association, and it simply says Donald D. Tadora, Montgomery County PSA Water Operator of the Year, April 2013. So if everyone would like to come down, I think we all like want to congratulate him. Yeah. 
Doug, we want to thank you very, very much for your work with the ESA and the county of Montgomery. And, and we hope that you have many more years here with us. Nice to have something to look forward to like that, and we appreciate Mr. Tudora very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a delegation. There's two. The first one is the Blacksburg Children's Museum, and uh, we have Miss Janine Neola. Janine Canola. I reside at 3415 Gordon Drive in Blacksburg. I'm joined by my fellow board member Paula Bolte, also from Blacksburg. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you this evening. I'm excited to share with you our plans for establishing a children's museum in Montgomery County. I just have listed here our other board members. Um, we also have numerous volunteers that are represented um, from residences all over the county. We are all volunteers at this point. We are a 501c3 organization. Um, so we're all at this point volunteers without any paid employees. Um, and we've worked very far hard over the last few years to establish our organization and begin the community outreach and fundraising process for a children's museum. Our mission statement is to nurture the curiosity and creativity of children through the exploration of science, technology, the arts, and regional heritage. And with that, we'll establish hands-on exhibits that will help children of all ages, starting with babies under one year old through ages of 10 and even middle school age, to explore these different content areas um, the arts could be dramatic art, fine art, performance art, as well as all of the sciences and technology, as well as our local community. We recognize that a children's museum can really benefit our community. As an economic driver to help um, bring family members who might be visiting our community, to spend the day visiting um, restaurants, shopping. It bridges other areas of the community, whether it's the universities and the rich cultural areas that we already have established in our area. Many children's museums are established as downtown or community revitalization efforts where there may be some depression or areas that don't have a lot of businesses. And when they start to open and people come to the area, other businesses start to flourish. We plan to offer programs after school, on weekends, homeschool programs, and even during breaks in summer, such as camps and other field trip endeavors that we can work with the county schools on, as well as to um, facilitate visitors from all areas of our state and Southwest Virginia. So really, to bring people to our county um, is, is certainly an endeavor that we're looking forward to. 
These are the nearest children's museums that represent membership in the Association of Children's Museums, which is a worldwide organization that supports museums that offer um, museums hands-on exhibits for children. So as you can see, with the nearest museums being pretty far away, the closest being over a two-hour um, or nearly a two-hour drive. So we recognize that there's certainly a need in our area um, to facilitate a museum that our community can visit on an easier basis. And it is true, and, and many of these are reciprocal, have reciprocal memberships, so they will draw families from these other areas because most families say if you visit one children's museum, the kids want to go to more. So they'll say, where's the next one we can go to next weekend, mommy and daddy? And I guarantee we will have visitors from beyond our local area visiting these children's museums. Supporting early childhood education is, is very important. As you know, um, if you invest in a child's early education, you're investing in their life. And it really has proven to reduce costs in, in child education over time, whether it's remedial education um, or special education later in life. And of course, stimulating a child's mind is helping them to become interested in school and in things that will help them to be future learners uh, throughout their life. So you're, you're definitely investing in something that's going to help to increase earnings later on and increase the tax revenue that you'll have from our families and children who attend museums. Just to talk a little bit about some of the recent activities that we've had, um, just a couple of weeks ago we had a sneak peek which was basically creating a children's museum for a day. And we did this at the First and Main Shopping Center in Blacksburg in one of the open retail areas. We had about 3,000 square feet that we jammed with um, nearly 10 exhibits that encompassed um, creative art, a spy science exhibit, a kids' grocery store, as well as a fire station and a veterinary clinic. Um, so as you can see, it was incredibly crowded. We estimate 1,000 attendees between our open hours of 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. throughout that one day. Um, so as you can see, a lot of families and children interacting together. Um, in the upper left of, of this slide is uh, the Blacksburg High School robotics team sharing their engineering skills um, and entertaining the kids with a robot that threw frisbees, so the children were catching it. Working at the grocery store, building with large blocks. We had a music activity. We had um, an engineering activity with a ball maze, and we hope to expand on that in the future where it could be something that the children could manipulate the track. We had veterinarians helping to work with children looking through microscopes as well as to help take care of their injured stuffed animals as well as looking at some, some great x-rays so the children were, were learning about um, animals and what it's like to be a veterinarian. So really helping to explore um, future careers and, and really pique the interest of these young children. So as far as our future plans, we really want to open permanently. We, we know that there is a desire and support in our community um, that's proven that many people have been now talking about for many months. Uh, when are you going to open? When are you doing that at the museum again? Um, and that's really what we're, we're hoping to achieve. We're working on exhibit development now and some fundraising plans. And we really hope that the county will help us in supporting our financial initiatives. We recognize that our projected annual operating expenses will be nearly $300,000 a year, which include uh, many of the things that you see here, such as our lease, insurance, salaries for full-time staff, as well as the hourly staff that we'll have working at the museum when we open on a regular basis. General business expenses, such as computer, phone, internet, membership in the Association of Children's Museums, and attending conferences so we can learn how to stay up to date on early childhood education and other um, creative uh, exhibits that we can bring to our community. 
We're currently a member of uh, Downtown Blacksburg Incorporated, only because that's really kind of where we establish. But as I said, we really want to be out um, and, and have a reach farther beyond Blacksburg. Um, we are a state incorporation, and as I mentioned, a, a 501c3. So we do have to keep that up every year. We anticipate some uh, capital expenses that we're currently working on. Specifically, our largest expense will be our exhibits and supplies. So having sustainable exhibits that can sustain, sustain uh, children playing and, and reusing, <laughs> and of course, uh, art supplies that we would need to um, re refill on a regular basis. We hope that all children can, can play and, and take some of the, the activities and, and crafts that they might be making home with them as, as a memento of, of how they spent their day at the Children's Museum. Uh, signage will be, of course, very important. Um, we are in communications with First and Main. We don't have a permanent space yet, but we have been speaking with them um, about uh, utilizing one of the empty retail spaces. They really recognize the benefit that we provided on our sneak peek day and all the businesses in that general area. Um, certainly recognize that, that their lunch crowd and dinner crowds went up that day and they had a lot of foot and sales traffic in the retail stores. Uh, so obviously signage will be important, an exterior sign that we estimate will be um, at least $2,000, uh, <clears throat> plus interior signage just for each of the exhibits, labeling, restroom signs, things of course that will need to make sure that everyone feels safe and knows what to do when they come and visit our museum. Uh, the furniture and decor, um, kid-sized tables and chairs will be approximately $200 each. We estimate at least six tables and chair sets to, to, to seat maybe a, a classroom size of 30 children if we were to do an activity where we might have a field trip. Um, so as an example of some of the, the furniture that we require, uh, as well as just a welcome desk so that we can greet our visitors and, and be able to, to manage the day-to-day um, -day workings of the museum and, and having our uh, entrance fee being you know, pleasant for everyone when they come in. Um, and our exhibits, uh, we have priced and are working with different fabricators um, for exhibits right now. We know that a, a fire exhibit specifically will, uh, we've estimated and have budgeted approximately $30,000. So that's kind of on the high end of an individual exhibit. L others that we have looked at are anywhere between $2,000 for a lot of utilizing our community talents to build and create some of the exhibits individually, um, and then some of the supplies that we would need for building blocks and bricks, and we've looked at different suppliers uh, for companies that, that sell durable type equipment that we could reuse and, and sustain the test of time and children playing um, will be approximately $5,000. So for all of our exhibits total, um, in the three to 5,000 square foot range will be about $100,000. We anticipate that we can have, um, for uh, museums that are our size and for the community in our local area, um, to sustain an, a museum that would have about 10 and upwards to 20,000 visitors annually. Um, and even if we charge $5 per person admission, we recognize as a nonprofit that we will continue to need um, annual fundraising, um, as well as just our capital expenditures for the get-go. So we wanted to just kind of explain what, what that means. And, and you know, just charging admission $5 per person would probably be the max that we would want to charge to visit our museum on, on a daily basis would not be able to cover the cost of, of our needs. So we wanted to just introduce you to the Children's Museum. We hope you learned a little bit. We've given you some materials. We encourage you to visit our website to learn more about us. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and others in the community if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, is there any questions or comments from the board, Ms. Uh, Brown? Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, for more information, uh, financial help. Uh, what are you looking for from this, from the county, from the Board of Supervisors? And second, have you made any presentations to 
like the Blacksburg Town Council, and they made a commitment. And and by being in that area, I, I would think that you would be able to draw something from the town of Christiansburg as well. I mean, um, so enlighten me a little bit. Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, we have presented to the town of Blacksburg, who have been very supportive. Um, we're seeking similar funds from them, either um, you know capital expenses, and hopefully, and, and we haven't heard anything uh, officially, but we're hoping that on our annual basis, it could be something that both the towns, all of our neighboring towns in the county could support in an annual um, budget. So at this point of time, we'd love for support for some of our capital expenses, but if you could consider what our organization could represent on a long-term basis, we hope that you might consider us in, in your annual budgetary um, to support our annual expenses that we would need for operations. Um, we also plan to um, solicit and in, in, in apply for different grants, so absolutely. And then just private and corporate sponsorships will be our main source of support as it is for many nonprofits. Any other Thank you. comments or questions? Thank well, you very much. I would just say my yeah. only comment is I think it's really exciting, you know, being a, a public school teacher in my other job that I could see how this would really be used. Have you thought about um, for the furniture and that kind of thing, are you thinking it has to be new or are you thinking you want to go for new or do you, are you, could it be donated or could it be like a project like you were talking about the tables and all? Could someone actually make something and donate it? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we recognize that we have many talents in our community and we certainly don't feel like we have to have everything mm -hmm. brand new. Um, many other museums may even have exhibits that, that we can borrow um, or, or rent. So we've already started to communicate with other museums about that possibility. And sometimes it means that it needs to be mended <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because it might have, have been worn and used. But absolutely, even for our furniture, we, we welcome anything to help us to get started. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much, Janine. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the uh, quarterly report from the Virginia Corporate Extension Office. And I would like to invite Michelle Dickerson up. And later on, she'll, we'll be introducing our new Corporate Extension Office. Agent. Uh, Agent. Agent. <laughs> Good evening to everybody and thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what Co Cooperative Extension has been doing in recent months. Um, I wanted to start by um, just introducing you to our new Agriculture and Natural Resources agent. We are so thrilled to um, finally have that person in our office and so we have a full staff again and we're very happy about that. So I'm going to introduce um, Kelly Scott as our um, Ag and Natural Resources agent. She's going to tell you a little bit. She hasn't been with us very long, but a little bit about what she's been doing, and then I'll give the 4-H report. Hey, folks. It's so nice to be here with you tonight, and it's nice to be with Virginia Co Cooperative Extension and be here in Montgomery County. Um, as Michelle said, I am a new hire to Virginia Cooperative Extension in Montgomery County. I've been hired since April the 10th, so I'm about six or seven weeks in, so I'm still in my infant stage, as I like to say. Um, but in the past few weeks, I have been very busy. Um, one of the, my main objectives as a new agent is just to make a lot of connections within the county with farmers as well as business owners, folks such as yourselves other government officials, so I've been doing that. Um, I've also been participating in a lot of new agent trainings through Virginia Tech and Virginia State University, the, uh, the housers of, of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Um, I attended an agritourism meeting in Vinton uh, not too long ago, which was a great preparation um, for a, a new project for here in the New River Valley. As I'm sure many of you know, Giles, Pulaski, and Montgomery County have been awarded grants um, through the ADI, excuse me, AFID and the HCD um, to provide a plan, an agritourism and agribusiness plan for the New River Valley, seeing how we can assist farmers and, and business associated with that. Um, so through that 
a workshop in Vinton. Uh, some of our folks in Montgomery County were there, so I was introduced to them on that day, and then I met with them after that just to discuss this agritourism grant a little bit more. It's also given me the opportunity to work with other agents in surrounding counties and in the New River Valley, so that's been really great. Um, I've been working with Steve Sandy uh, in planning and Lisa, our tourism director here in the building. Um, one thing I'd like to let you folks know about is we plan some meetings uh, to engage the public and farmers, producers, anyone who may be interested in agritourism. And there's one set for each county, Montgomery, Pulaski, and Giles. Ours is on June 6th, which I believe is a Thursday, but it'll be downstairs. So I'd like to invite you to that. This is on our uh, homepage of the Montgomery County website. So please, anyone that you know that's in agriculture or interested in this type of venture, please let them know and, and tell them to come out. We welcome their opinion. What time is it on June 6th? Uh, six o'clock. And it shouldn't last, but the, the expended time is till eight, six to eight. So it's not an extremely long meeting. Um, I've also attended a two day workshop uh, for the Appalachian Food Shed Project, which was also in the same vein of this agritourism grant and promoting regional and local food systems. I assisted with the 2013 Roanoke Area Junior 4-H Livestock Show. That was just this past weekend at Virginia Tech. And me being a horticulture plant person, that was definitely an eye-opening experience and really fun. I got to weigh some sheep and goats, so I, I suggest you all do that at least once in your life. <laughs> um, I've met with the other New River Valley A&R agents, agriculture and natural resources agents, and the director of Kentland Farms. We are working on developing an agriculture field day for this August set at Kentland Farm, and that's for new producers or producers 10 years or less. It's, it's targeted towards the beginning farmer. I've worked a lot with the Master Gardener Coordinator for the New River Valley, Wendy Silverman, on the Master Gardener Program, and in June we will be uh, participating in the Master Gardener College at Virginia Tech. Um, for 2013, the Master Gardener Program graduated 23 participants, so that's 23 new folks that we have willing to volunteer their time for activities and services to benefit Montgomery County. Also, our second annual plant sale was a success. It was here um, in the parking lot on May 11th, and I think we made $300 more than we did last year, so woo! Mm -hmm. um, I'll continue to, to answer client questions related to agriculture and natural resources. Um, I'm also working with other agents in surrounding counties uh, on the Junior Hokie Showcase. It's an agriculture day directed towards fourth graders that will be held this fall. Um, in addition to those activities, I look forward to meeting you all in person. I've worked with Mr. Politis a lot and I've um, Welcome all of your support and opinion as I move forward in this position um, and see how we can work together to benefit the folks of Montgomery County. Do you guys have any questions for me? Any questions, Ms. Scott? No so. questions, but I'll say welcome, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. It's, I'm happy to be a part of the team. Thank you, Kelly. It's exciting. Yeah. And for the 4-H report tonight, I have a special treat for you. I'm always um, trying to encourage our 4-Hers to um, build some leadership skills. And um, one of our clubs this year, as some of you know, has been studying um, the government project, my government project. And so I've um, tried to encourage them to attend um, one of our Board of Supervisors meetings so they can see the governmental process in action. And, and participate as well. And so I'm happy to have three of our 4-Hers from one of our clubs today that um, on short notice came out and decided to um, share with you a little bit about um, one of the uh, pro some of the projects they've been doing over this past year. So I'm gonna introduce, if you guys wanna join me. <clears throat> this is Heather Osborne, Emily Austin, and Joshua Thompson. And um, they, they're all members of our 4 Him 4-H club. And so they have a little slide presentation they want to um, um, show you. Joshua, you want to tell them a little bit about what your club's been doing this year? Um, this year, we studied my government. And Can you so move a little closer to the mic, please? Um, so we covered 
whole bunch of stuff within that, uh, from local government all the way up to uh, national, state, and stuff. Uh, also, kind of how things have progressed from the founding fathers, how they did things all the way through up how um, it functions today. Um, we did several field trips, uh, one of which was to here, and looked around here, uh, Will Williamsburg, and the state capitol, and Washington, D.C. Um, it was a really fun year, and <laughs> All right, so we're going to show you their slideshow here that they put together for us. While you're uh, putting that together, Michelle, I just want to thank you young people for coming and Mr. Uh, Meadows and myself had the great honor of showing them around our government center a couple of weeks ago and uh, I'm, I'm glad you came this evening. While you're watching their slideshow, I will say that this, this is our longest running club in the county at this point, and they do really wonderful projects every single year. They're um, very intensive projects, and they incorporate, it, this is a homeschool group, and they incorporate their 4-H projects into um, all of their educational objectives, and so it's just a really nice fit the way they work together. So it's a very active club. And some of, some of the pictures you're seeing here are 4-H Day at the State Capitol. Um, we, they have probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, um, I don't remember the totals, but thousands of 4-Hers visiting the State Capitol one day in February and having the opportunity to meet some of our senators and delegates and tour the um, State Capitol building and the governor's mansion and um, watching um, the legislative sessions from the gallery, all of those things. Thank you, and we thank you for spending time with our club and showing them the ins and outs of our government center here. And I'll, I'll just leave you with just a couple of other things that we've um, been doing in 4-H. A lot of our typical programs, uh, ending the year with a lot of our school programs, our stream quality assessment programs that we do with sixth grade um, science students at Blacksburg Middle School. Um, we are preparing for 4-H camp as usual. You hear me talk about that every year. But again, we have close to 170 um, children just from our county, 170 children, um, teens and adults that are attending camp in less than two weeks now. So as you can imagine, we're all a nervous wreck getting ready for, for that. And um, State 4-H Congress, a lot of these teens attend State 4-H Congress and give presentations competing for a state award at Congress every year. 
and um, I've been asked to be the Dean of State Congress this year, which has been a pretty big job, but it's given me an, the opportunity to work with our state 4-H cabinet, which is our officers for 4-H across the state, ambassadors from each of our district districts, as well as um, the state officers. And so having been through that experience, I'm hoping to encourage some of our 4-Hers to run for one of those offices as a state ambassador or officer one day. So that's been a very good experience for me. So um, we, um, so I apologize for getting you our written report a little later than usual. It's just been pretty hectic, but I'm happy to answer any questions either now or later after you've had a chance to read over it about our programs. Yeah. So. Any questions or comments? Excellent. Ms. Perkins? Great program. Great. Yeah. Well, I would like to recognize also Susan Birch, who yes, is the uh, Thank you. leader of the group, I believe. Yes. And she brought the uh, young folks over to the government center. And it, it was really a very, very uh, enlightening experience for me to see this interaction and uh, inspiration that these kids have. Right. A lot of very good questions. Yeah. A lot of very good questions. Um, Susan Birch and Lorreen Thompson are our two organizational leaders for this particular club. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome aboard, Kelly. <laughs> All right. At this time, I have to uh, remove myself from this process as there is a, uh, what do I want to say, business? Conflict. Okay. With uh, our people in the public hearing, and I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Brown. Okay, the next item on our agenda is public hearings. Subject A, the following public hearing was advertised pursuant to law in the birds section of the Roanoke Times on April 25th. May 2nd, May 9th, 2013. Item 1, rezoning requests. Curtis W. and Deborah R. Goad. Requests by Curtis W. and Deborah R. Goad, agent of County Hill, to rezone approximately 41 hundreds of an acre from Agriculture A1 to General Business with possible profit conditions to allow a restaurant. The property is located at 4040 Rhino Road, identified as tax parcel number 119A-A-27 in the Rhino Magistral District. The property currently lies in an area designated as village expansion in the 2025 comprehensive plan and further described as mixed use within the Rhino Village plan. Thank you. Up, uh... Glad to be here with you this evening. Uh, this is our vicinity map uh, showing the location of this proposed rezoning in the southern portion of the county on the eastern side of Rhino Road. And then we have our zoning map, which indicates the proposed site in this dark blue or purple line. Um, the white on this map indicates that all those sites are zoned agricultural A1. The orange is a general business area and that's what we're trying to do is expand the general business area across Route, route, route 8 to include this uh, small parcel. This is an aerial photograph of the site as you can see uh, it's joining Route 8 right here and there uh, it's a it's a small residential use that's been converted to a, a business use uh, several years ago in 2002 the um, owners uh, acquired a special use permit to use this as a specialty shop in the agricultural zone. It's limited to, uh, currently limited to 2,000 square feet and the most recent business there I believe was Traveling Treasures. If you'll notice the aerial photograph, this area over here to the um, west of Route 8 is the Reiner Food Mart and I think this is the uh, uh, gasoline canopy there I think to give you a general feel for where this is located. Also, I'll ask you to notice that we are surrounded to the north, to the east, and the south uh, by single-family residential uses. 
The uh, Montgomery County 2025 Comprehensive Plan map shows this site here in the uh, purple area, which designates our mixed use areas, and that uh, Comprehensive Plan map qualifies this area for the rezoning that's being requested today. So th this applicant is requesting rezoning from A1 to general business, as Mr. Brown read, to allow uh, a restaurant. Uh, and we talked about the current special use permit in place. Uh, the address is 4040 Reiner Road. Uh, Connie Hale operates the current Buffalo and Moore restaurant located uh, across Reiner Road from this site. And she has a strong desire to relocate her restaurant to provide a growth opportunity there. They have a loyal customer base and they feel that Reiner is a great place to have this business and wish to remain there in that community. So the relocation would provide additional parking for the restaurant, which hopefully will allow the growth of the restaurant. So as I mentioned earlier, this site is owned Agricultural A1, which does allow a restaurant with a special use permit. However, when we took a look at the zoning ordinance, we realized pretty quickly that we were gonna have to um, pursue rezoning to general business to meet the impervious surface requirements in the code because we were going to have to um, add parking to serve this proposed restaurant. So we'll take a look at a few of the impacts here as we consider the rezoning request. Regarding transportation, there was no Chapter 527 review required uh, based on the uh, size and the, uh, uh, the uh, number of visits per day that would be projected there. VDOT's 2011 annual daily traffic volume estimate, that's a mouthful I'll tell you, uh, is about 8,700 vehicle trips per day. We spoke with John Jones and uh, the applicant has uh, revised the concept plan which has been um, considered for approval to actually relocate the entrance from the existing, um, basically the center portion of the lot to the northern side of the lot to provide a more direct access into the property without creating any congestion, hopefully, and, and limiting the uh, problems it would cause in Route 8. So we talk about infrastructure next. This site is served by PSA Water. Um, also on site is a private sewage disposal system. Now, the um, applicant has indicated that she wishes to connect to public sewer and we talked with Bob Frank, our PSA director, and he says that a private easement for the private sewer line crossing private property between this parcel <coughs> and the public sewer force main would be required and if she can acquire that then there's a great possibility they would be using public sewer instead of a septic system that would be much preferable to uh, what's there now. There will be really no impact to the schools because uh, this is to be used for commercial purposes. So in considering the rezoning to general business, there, we think that the uses allowed in that general business district would be basically compatible with what's going on in this er area because this is a very small piece of property, 41 hundredths of an acre, it's a tiny lot. The, uh, there are also topographic constraints on this property. It slopes from the uh, Route 8 upward to the rear and, and there's several feet change there. Uh, also with appropriate infrastructure in place to support the proposed uses allowed in that general business district, we felt like it, it is a compatible rezoning. In addition, um, if the property is rezoned, there will be a site plan required and we will be looking for buffering to help provide some protection to the adjacent residential properties. So also we wanted to note that this area is designated in the village, in the comprehensive plan as village expansion. Uh, and further, in the Reiner village plan, you remember the map with the purple, it is described as mixed use. So um, what I wanted to tell you is that the comprehensive plan does support this rezoning. Uh, also the Reiner Village plan encourages mixed use and especially in small scale buildings with small building footprints that are compatible with the traditional commercial and civic uses in that area.
So this rezoning is requested, again, as I said, to allow a small restaurant and an existing structure on a small lot. The, uh, we have determined this uh, property qualified for rezoning based on section 1028 of the county code. We feel that this zoning will, this proposed rezoning will increase the intensity of the commercial use in that area and obviously will bring more traffic to this site than it has seen in the past. Um, but we feel like that VDOT's on board and, and think that they can manage the uh, traffic increase there without too much problem. Also, uh, there are some traffic improvements along Route 8 proposed there with um, the school expansion in that area, so there will be, be some upgrades in the area anyway. They are fortunate to be in this location. So the applicants will be required to provide a site plan for review based on all the county code regulations should this rezoning be approved. And they will include things like parking and landscaping, lighting, and that sort of thing. Um, gave you some photographs here in your packet, and we'll go through those very quickly. This is a uh, view from Route 8 of the, of the uh, site. You can see it looks very much like a dwelling. Uh, the handicap accessibility is already provided to this unit because it has been used for uh, business use before. Uh, this is a view looking toward Floyd County on Route 8. The rear yard of the proposed site. Uh, looking south to the single family residence uh, next door. And of course we're shooting across there to the Bronner Food Mart. And southeast, other single family uses with a, one of the churches there and runner to the rear. And the next closest neighbor is uh, 4032 Runner Road on the northern boundary line. So this um, slide shows you the revised concept plan. Basically, the entrance was much in the center of the site and they are proposing to move the commercial entrance to this area which gives us a straighter shot into the property allowing some parking probably along this area accessing the rear to provide some additional parking that they will need to have to uh, comply with the uh, site plan section of the county code. Uh, so we met with the planning commission on May 8th they felt that this was a very good project with a business that has established some respect in that community and it's, it's evidenced by the strong support of that uh, business. There were several people in the audience that evening at the Planning Commission meeting. Only three of them spoke but there were many, many stood in support of the rezoning request. So the Commission has recommended approval of this request to you by a vote of six to zero. And we notified the attorney property owners. I did not receive any inquiries about the uh, request. And I, I have the um, applicant here in the uh, room this evening along with several other people in support of her. Uh, and I expect they will make a few comments once we're finished here. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> I've got a couple of things that I'd just like to clear up and make sure that I understand exactly where and what. And I just kind of jot down some notes here as I went along. And parking spots, how many are needed there? We have estimated uh, 16. They're showing a few more than that on the site plan and I don't think they'll get quite that many, but it looks like we'll be pretty close to what's needed. Okay, and you think 16 would be all you would have at a final build out on that? I think so, based on the code requirements. We'll, we'll evaluate this. I'm working off of a concept plan here that's, you know, needs to be fine tuned a little bit if, if the rezoning is approved and they'll go through a uh, licensed architect or engineer to develop a, a full blown site plan for me. Next thing is what sewage is there now? And when I say that, in the size of the septic tank that is there, what is it put in for it to, to carry? I don't really have that information from the health department, although there is some septic there in the rear yard. Um, 
they, they are pretty sure that they should be able to connect a public sewer toward um, the rear of the property to Union Valley. There's a, a sewer line back there that they think they can get to. They've already made some contacts to try to get easements. And yeah, I think that's a force main back there. Yes, sir, it is. Mm -hmm. and, and is that the plan? Is that something that uh, we can pretty much count on that that's going to happen? I see a lot of... I don't, I don't have a guarantee, <laughs> but yes, they have been strongly uh, pursuing that and, and working with Mr. Falk in that regard. And, and um, However, they, they must acquire their own private easement across private property to get to that force main. And this next thing is more of a question for myself than anything else because I've asked, been asked this on several things. And that is, what is the, what, uh, is the setbacks for, is it any different for businesses than it is for residential as far as sides and rear and front? Yes, it is. However, this is in the village plan and, and our uh, code allows for some flexibility with these infill uh, businesses and that sort of thing. So we were stuck with a, a very small lot and an existing structure. So we would work along with that. Um, normally you'd get in residential zones and your agricultural zones, you'd have a 40 foot setback. This, prop, this house or structure probably predates 1969, I would assume. Uh, so it may not be exactly uh, com uh, meeting the requirements of today, but um, the way the village plans work, we can we can have some flexibility there on the um, setback requirements. Where is that? You said 40 on the front. What about the rear? Uh, typically, in agricultural and some of the and some of the residential zones, it's 40 front and rear, and 15 on the sides. Okay, I'd about wipe it out one. <laughs> it's a small lot, but we understand that, and it's it's gonna. We'll have to be careful in in preparing the site plan and be a little bit creative for that. But it, you know, it's been used for a business before. Sure, and I, like I said, that's right there. I knew that what you showed, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have enough, but I, I didn't know exactly what the numbers were. So I wanted to get that down. Thank you. Yes. Sir. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to open it up for public comment now uh, on this public hearing. <coughs> we have uh, one person, uh, Mr. I guess uh, Pat Smith, signed up to speak. And please come to the speaker's podium and clearly state your name and address using the uh, podium microphone. And you have five minutes. Pat Smith, I reside at 2125 Fairview Church Road in Ryan, Virginia. I'm in support of the restaurant that provides a vital service for our community. They are active participants in the community and uh, they need to expand as a small business and provide employment. We'll provide more employment once they move across the street and uh, I think we'll actually enhance the uh, business community in Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other people who would like to speak who didn't get an opportunity to sign the sign-up sheet? If there are, uh, you can please come forward and state your name uh, and address. And you have five minutes. My name is uh, William Pack. I live on 3473 Five Points Road, and I own. Um, the property right next to the left of this the property and it's okay with me and I'm all for it it's, I think it'd be a good addition to the to the runner area and uh, I would rather go behind my to my property to hook up, hook up the sewer system on the Probably I don't know the other, uh, the other side if she needed to. And uh, thank you for letting me say my piece. Thank you, Mr. Pack. Or anyone else uh, who would like to comment? 
Hello, I'm Connie Hale. I'd like to thank you for looking at the proposed rezoning uh, of this location. Um, we've been a part of Reimer now for several years and we want to continue to grow out there and we have tremendous support from all of the wonderful customers that we have out there and we just want to continue to be a good part of Reimer and Montgomery County. Anybody have any questions for me? Thank you both, all very much. Okay. Well, I guess we'll close the public hearing, Jim, and uh, turn the, the second part back over to you, disposal of the next item, disposal of county-owned property. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm gonna find out my way back here. I can't get out of here. There we go. Too rough on it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Got it easy. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is another public hearing, disposal of county-owned property. The Board of Supervisors' intent to dispose of the following owned property: 0.375 acre parcel located adjacent to North Franklin Street and Business 460, north of the. County Drive, tax parcel 406-A-23, parcel ID 180236. And um, who's gonna speak on this? I can Mary lead, I'll, I'll lead off. And um, this is actually a piece of property that the county has owned for a number of years. It's a, it's a strip piece of property uh, adjacent to North Franklin Street probably an old roadbed that was there from some time ago. Uh, we've recently had interest expressed in uh, someone that may be interested in purchasing that property. County has no public use for that property. It would make sense to try to um, sell it to a, an adjoining property owner who could put it to use and also put it back on the tax rolls. So that's the reason we're asking the board to declare this parcel surplus. Okay, is there any? Just the uh, under state law for the county can convey any interest in property up to the public here. So that's the purpose of this. Okay. At this time, there's nobody signed up for this public hearing. But if there's anybody in the audience who would like to speak to this public hearing, please step forward, state your name and address, and we have five minutes. Seeing no one, are there any questions of board members? This public hearing is now closed. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our public address. And we have no one signed up for public address. But if there's anybody in the audience who would like to speak, please step forward, state your name and address, and you have five minutes. Seeing no one, we'll now close our public address. The next item is an addendum, and we do not have any. Uh, following the addendum is our consent agenda. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Um, yes, I'd just like to um, say that I'm, I was glad to see the money in there for the roof replacement of the Christiansburg um, Library. They're in great need. They're also in need of a van. Their van broke down. And then the other thing is the circulation desk at the Blacksburg Library. So I was glad to see that some of our monies were being used in these areas, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Roll call, please. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Chairman Lewis? Aye. Six aisles. And now we're going to new business. And the uh, first item on our new business is the Joint Law Enforcement Mutual Aid Agreement. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. 
Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Chair Colettis? Aye. Six ayes. And the next item is subject B, appropriation leased office space. And uh, this is concerning be to have a location to house our reassessment group when we believe it or not it's time to start working on that again <laughs> so uh, our reassessment folks that we contract with uh, need space uh, for the last two reassessment cycles we used the space in building C for that purpose but we don't have building C anymore for that purpose and also uh, we've been working for some time to try to find another site for the magistrate's office the magistrate's office is currently located in the old clerk's office i believe as it's known downtown christiansburg um, that building is having some issues and uh, from a liability standpoint and just from a standpoint of providing a safe uh, efficient work environment for the magistrate's office we're looking to relocate uh, them and the property that we're looking to leasing looking into leasing is the old medicine shop uh, building on uh, mm -hmm. North Franklin in Christiansburg it's adjacent to the stellar one bank um, at one point in time it actually was a bank i'm not sure it was the first national exchange bank mm -hmm. years ago it was first national exchange bank um, the medicine shop was the last tenant in the building um, it's got a lot of open space uh, it's going to be very easy uh, to upfit and uh, we've been negotiating with the property owner and think we've got a very fair lease to to move into that building for the reassessment group and for the magistrate so that's why we're asking for the money okay, any discussion okay, have we already got the motion no, no. make the motion please so moved second been moved and seconded there's no further discussion and and the only thing i would say is if you've been in the magistrate's office as part of my profession sometimes you go in there there's serious mold issues there's some safety issues when you're dealing with inmates in, in regards to that situation and you can see the brick is falling off the back of the building and so i, I i'm not an engineer but when i see bricks falling off the building I, I tend to think that there might be an issue there uh, so i think that's that's one of the things that we have to to address thank you roll call please mr Cree. I'm going to vote I, but I would like to in the future have a little more leadway into no use me asking you if you've done this, that, or the other if we're going to vote on it now. So, uh, and I vote out. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Chair Lewis? Aye. Six eyes. All right. And uh, right here. the next item is to go into work session. Do I have a motion, please? I move. Second. Been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Chair Pilatus? Aye. Six eyes. And our work session item is Watch for Children Sign Policy. I'm, I'll be glad to cover this one. Um, Judy Kaiser does a great job of making sure our policies and practices are up to date in accordance with the various other policies and procedures that we have to follow and we became aware uh, over the last year that the state code was amended in 2012 regarding watch for children signs um, in neighborhoods uh, previously um, if a citizens group or a community wanted a, a watch for children sign erected in the neighborhood they brought that information to the county uh, this county staff reviewed it if it met certain criteria was passed along to the Department of Transportation and VDOT would install and maintain the signage. Uh, in 2012, they changed the policy, VDOT changed the policy that effective July 1st, 
uh, to allow for counties and towns to undertake the installation and maintenance of such signs um, uh, and VDOT no longer has a role in that um, and so what we need to do is um, get the board's authorization to revise our policy to match what VDOT requires uh, for the watch for children sign program which basically means that a can I'll, I'll just read it. A county or town may initiate the installation of the signs by entering into an agreement with VDOT that specifies the location of the sign. So VDOT does approve the location. The county or town is solely responsible for the purchase, installation, and maintenance of the signs and must pay all associated costs. Uh, secondary roadway construction or maintenance funds or any other VDOT monies may not be used to pay for such signs previously. That's the funding that was used for the signage. Uh, VDOT may not install these signs on behalf of a county or town. Previously they did. And the process prescribed in the previous statute whereby a county or town could request by resolution that VDOT install these signs is no longer an option. Um, so basically, um, through this policy change, VDOT's placing that responsibility back on um, the counties and towns if you want to have one of those signs. So, Question. Yes, sir. Do the towns have full responsibility of this request for things that are in the towns? If it's a sign within the town limits, yes, it, it will be responsible. And also for new ones? That yes, sir. In? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, now, this policy, VDOT, uh, uh, one thing VDOT points out in this policy change, the existing signs are yellow and black, I believe. Um, the new signs will be green and white. And so VDOT will continue to maintain the signs that they have previously erected for the towns and the, and the county. Uh, they will not maintain any future signage. So I mainly want to bring this to your attention and ask for your direction in allowing us to amend our policy to match um, what VDOT has requested. It's not a huge issue. We probably get a couple of requests a year um, for these type signs. I can't remember, honestly, when the last one we had. But um, and and the other thing that um, the board needs to provide us with some direction on is you do have the I mean you do have the ability to pass those costs on to the requesting parties, or the county can just say we'll pay the costs associated with putting up the signs. Probably going to really surprise us how much it costs to put up a sign. Mm -hmm. it, I believe it's eight hundred and fifty dollars, which shocked me yeah, as v, far as the sign. I think it's a rip. Yeah, VDOT said in two thousand eleven dollars, the average cost to purchase and install a single such sign is eight hundred and fifty dollars. Is there a limit on, especially on the streets, like three hundred or six hundred feet? I've seen that somewhere that there's a limit. Uh, it yeah, has to be so long before. It, can't even be qualified to get us. It does say that the speed limit cannot be greater than 35 miles an hour. So I know that, and I, I'm looking to see if I see anything related to. It says it somewhere. It's a whole list of rules in that document. It can't be within 200 feet of the posted speed limit sign. Page one of three. Yes, sir. Number two at the bottom of the page. Uh, road must be 300 feet or more in length. Okay, there it is. Yes, sir. And the road must have a daily traffic count of at least 200 vehicles. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm seeking tonight is, do you do you want us to move forward with amending our policy okay. to match the new state policy, and we'll bring that to yes, you. Sir. And then the other question is, what are your thoughts on requiring reimbursement for the signs if we're requested? So, like, is this like another type of unfunded mandate that was that's, passed down? That's right. Okay. And so we don't have a choice. I mean, if you're going to have one of these signs, you have to, this is the way you're going to have to do it. No. The only choice you have is how you're going to pay for it. Right. To me, this seems like a governmental function. We have children who are playing in an area. If we believe that this area needs a sign to warn drivers, 
rather than have the people in the neighborhood necessarily pay for it or one family or two or three families mm -hmm. this seems to be a governmental function to me mm -hmm. rather than put the off but that's just my thoughts well if you read the statute it says the cost of the signs and their installation shall be paid by the county well well that's true yeah that's pretty strong yeah that <laughs> means you better do it <laughs> Okay, do we have a consensus to um, go Do you have ahead? a choice in the sign, or do you have to use the one that cost $850? There's a, a uniform M -U -T manual. DC, yeah. uh, it's about that thick, mm -hmm. and uh, I can't think of the exact title of it. But it's a municipal uniform traffic control. But you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and so before you put up a sign, I don't care what it is, but they have a department they have to comply with this uniform MUTD manual thing so if you see if you out of state if you're from California and you see that sign you know what the uh, it's universal right, that's what yeah. I'm saying and what the uh, compliance is but is the maker universal I mean you have to use the thing that I mean what if somebody else can make the sign and make it cheaper the yellow and green and orange and black are advisory signs Advisory uh, signs are different from the black and white signs. Like if it's 55, by God, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. you know, you comply with that. If it's 40, the yellow and black says uh, curve ahead 45, that's an advisory that a curve is ahead. But if it's a black and white sign 45, then you can get a, get a, get a ticket on that again. But the, the advisory, it's just advisory, like curve signs and, and, and so forth. And also, Mary, if you look at Agreement that the has is the size and type of sign you use, uh, and then it references some the catalog. Yeah. So it looks like they're going to they're going to dictate the size. Right. Well, there's yeah, there's some other stuff on down below that that says in some cases B dot will be. Uh, Required to install and maintain the, this type of sign, so according to if it passes all their criteria, so, kind of fuzzy. I just think <laughs> I just think we we're in the wrong business. We'll start making them, them signs and installing them for about eight hundred fifty dollars. Well, they're getting out of the watch children at play, watch for children, biz, sign business. And, Okay, is there any further discussion on this? Do we I just agree think we that we some kind of somebody to decipher all this stuff and bring it down into a little smaller and bring what, it back to us next board we'll meeting? Do, what we can do is we will I'll have Judy amend the policy to mirror what the agreement says because one of the things we'll have to do is execute this agreement with VDOT that says we're gonna do this and we'll we'll give you some bullet points i just mainly wanted to make you aware of it it's not you know in the scheme of life it's not huge but it is another who changes the code of virginia the, the general, assembly? general assembly so we need to know how our folks voted on that tell them it's going to cost us some money did they discuss that with you because <laughs> they always supposed to call if it impacts counties oh nope. when that's special <laughs> no ma'am We'll find out. They, they slid down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess we'll bring this back to us at the next meeting. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, you for the executive summary. Thank you for the direction <laughs> on that. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, do I have a motion to go out of closed meeting? Some of it. Or a work session. How do we um, go work to session. Go work Excuse session. me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> Not really. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. How's that? <laughs> All right, uh, roll call, please. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Chair Paletis? Aye. Six ayes? All right, the next item on the agenda is the county attorney's report. I have no report. County administrator's report. Just two items, Mr. Chair. Uh, one, if you haven't had a chance to ride by the old courthouse, I would suggest that you do so in the next couple of days. Uh, they are as the old saying goes, they're going to town on that building. Um, there's going to be scaffolding 
pretty much all around it and the bricks are going to be coming off soon so uh, they're moving forward very quickly with the renovations on that very excited to get that project underway and we had a 911 authority meeting this afternoon at four o'clock and had a discussion that 14 months or so from now we'll be getting the joint authority dispatch authority up and running and you know that seemed just not that long ago that seemed like that was a vision way down the road but it's here mm -hmm. so we're very excited about that also uh, we had some great meetings with the uh, two town councils and the uh, school board uh, and I know everybody's had plenty of meetings lately but I'm going to be contacting you in the next week or so to start talking about when we can schedule our next extended work session as a group uh, it's hard to believe this as well, but our last work session that we had was July 30th of last year, and we updated our vision and mission, um, talked about several things as we look to continue to move the county forward. Uh, we're working with staff to develop uh, plans for the upcoming year, and we need to get back together to talk about where we are and where we're going. So I'll send you something out, probably looking at July, August time frame, but we'll get it out in plenty of time for folks to respond. And Mr. Chair, that's all I have. Okay. And uh, Supervisor Creed. Yeah, just to take care of a little business before we get too far along, I would like to move that we rezone the acreage from A1 to general business for uh, Curtis and Deborah Goad. And uh, I'd like to make that uh, as a motion to for, for uh, the board. I would like to second that, that motion. Okay, can I get involved in the moving second? Uh, okay, so we have some. Oh, yes, they took kind of click an eye on it. Uh, I was draw my my. Uh, can I second and or do I have to wait for a second? No, if I want to be some. You're good. You're okay. Right now. Okay. And uh, I guess um, any discussion at this particular point. Is there a reason that we're doing it now instead of like we would normally do at our next board meeting? Is there a hurry or something? There's uh, the staff report. The Planning Commission unanimously approved it, and it's overwhelmingly uh, support from the community and no zero opposition. And I don't see myself and Gary may feel the same way in the land in a couple weeks just to put them uh, further out than they could start doing what they need to do immediately. And at the Planning Commission, I know that there weren't as many folks, but there were probably 15 maybe 20 people who came out and support now all of them didn't speak but they basically all said hey we're all in favor right. we stood up and were very supportive of it um, and there was no negatives whatsoever at the planning commission meeting either any other discussion no, I was just asking that oh. because, you know, like when we do these kind of things and if someone else comes along, they might expect us to do the same thing. I'm in full support of it. Always have been, but I just wanted to make that, you know, like usually, you know, in our protocol, we have it at our next meeting. So if somebody else wants to come along, they might expect the same treatment. That's all I'm saying. We have done this type of thing several times in we the have. past have. when there's absolutely no opposition. Uh, no no opposition. opposition for for, the, for doing it, so just helps people get along with their business a little quicker. Does Jim now need to state the reasons? He can do that. Okay. Okay. Boo. Well, uh, roll call. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Curry? Aye. Chair Perlettis? Uh, I must abstain due to a conflict of interest. Have five eyes, one abstain. Okay, Ms. Creed, back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have no further business. Thank you, Ms. Creed. Ms. Perkins. Well, I want to know when Ms. Hale's going to open one a little closer to where I live. Uh, <laughs> I live in Blacksburg. Uh, and I can. Uh, 
I can tell you the food is delicious and uh, I can understand why um, you want to expand because uh, it, it's marvelous. Thank you so much. Um, I had t uh, just a couple things to report. I think all of you uh, saw in the newspaper that the Roanoke area, Roanoke Valley area MPO, <laughs> which I am your um, um, representative right. to, voted uh, the number one project to be the Greenway. Uh, so it looks like $14 million, the newspaper said. I, I think it's um, actually spread out over four years um, before they expect to have the entire thing uh, completed. Uh, it showed uh, around 12, a little over 12 million on the project list, but at the same time, there were other things that uh, were a part of it. So uh, 14 million is probably it. The second thing that was uh, voted on or talked about, and I guess will be talked about again, is um, a $200,000 study to look at um, freight intermodal transportation and particularly the Elliston site. I um, know that they know what our position has been on that and I didn't really vote in favor when we were talking about, but I think they'll kind of bring that back for some more discussion. But really, uh, the people who were there, uh, particularly people from uh, Roanoke and Salem, are uh, very uh, interested in this project and very happy to have this study. It's a study uh, to determine um, whether or not this is, I guess you might say it's um, something that uh, Norfolk Southern or others wish to do in terms of the benefits that would come for it versus the cost of establishing it. That's primarily it. I think it's a cost-benefit deal. And looking at what, what, um, what could come out of it in terms of supporting economic development in the area and the spin-offs that might come from it such but as manufacturing business. From my understanding, Ms. Perkins, they want to develop this report to use as a sales pitch to re-engage Norfolk Southern. And yes, they want to re-engage Norfolk Southern to this, and they're going to really study the Elliston site quite carefully. Um, there was much discussion, and there were several people who uh, were not in favor of the study. Um, in fact, um, one gentleman there said it was, um, that's a member of the board, said it was a waste of money. And uh, another person said, well, uh, Norfolk and Southern had taken a different view of it and were not so sure that it was beneficial or cost effective, if you want to put it that way. So there was. And, but there were people from the area who were very much in favor of it, um, looking at it and studying it and see what will come out of it um, if there's not, if, if the Elliston site is not um, what they're looking for, then perhaps there's one Dublin. some other place. In Salem or Well. Some people yeah. mentioned Dublin, but mostly um, the support. If you realize, this is the Roanoke Valley um, deal, and they were looking at it, I think, from the standpoint of Salem and, and Roanoke. And us, but Ellison happens to be the area that's included in this metropolitan planning organization area. So that's why they're looking at it from that standpoint. Um, so, um, stay tuned. <laughs> There's another, there will be another meeting next week. I'm sure it will come up. But I will tell you, the, um, the Greenway people 
were really together, and they were there very strongly represented, and it appears that $14 million is what they want to establish this greenway. It's uh, down by the Roanoke River, and well, I don't know, it's a very long place. It's a windy kind of a, a thing, but it's certainly um, a wonderful project. Then the other thing that I attended was the uh, Department of Social Services board meeting on the 20th. Uh, again, they have made some changes to the building. Um, they had some money to be able to use for some improvements, and I must say the improvements are very good. They now have a, a, a records room that is uh, uh, much better than what they've had. They were, did not, uh, they had boxes sitting around everywhere um, and they needed to have some better organization for that. They also needed some, just some upgrades, for instance, uh, with taking some of the old carpet out and putting in floors that are easy to take care of and, and then adding some other uh, carpet. So at any rate, uh, the, social services um, organization um, has so much to do um, and I'm astounded every week at the number of children that are either there because they need to have a place to go that's not their home. And there are a lot of people in Montgomery County who um, do take these children in, but more than that, there are a number of people who adopt these children. I thought it was a, a wonderful thing when there was one family that had these children, and there were three of them, and they agreed to adopt all three children to keep the brothers and sisters together. I also know um, a family in Blacksburg that did the same thing, that adopted three siblings. And when I talked to her about it, she said to me, I feel privileged to have these children and to have them be my children. And so um, there's a lot of good work and they work very hard to, to train the families for the foster parent program uh, and then to make certain that children um, are placed in homes where there's a caring environment. And they certainly follow up on that too. So um, the work that goes on there is uh, much needed and it's very good. So that's it. Mr. Brown. Well, one thing, and uh, at a most recent Fire and Rescue Commission meeting, the Fire and Rescue Commission would want, wanted me to convey to the, to the Board of Supervisors their appreciation and to say thank you to the Board for all the support given to them. Ms. Biggs. Um, I was just going to ask Ms. Perkins before I tell, tell him a couple things there. Um, we, that $200,000 to pay for that study, where does that money come from? What? The $200,000 to pay for that study, the intermodal thing, I mean, like, is that something Montgomery County has to pay money towards? Good. That it, it's, it's, federal, mm -hmm. it's federal transportation Most funds. Most of it is federal transportation funds. Good. They actually had... Um, Ms. Biggs, they actually have something like 15 different projects that they had there. Um, much larger totals than uh, 14 million for just one project. Uh, most of the projects um, were in two to six hundred thousand dollar range, but there were some that were a million eight hundred. Two million, one million five, three million five, and then um, some that were. There's one down for six million, and there's a plan. You can 
look at this if you'd like to have it. Uh, it won't all be done in one year. Is that right. you get these transportation funds, I think, every year, and grants uh, particularly. And so you use the money and you request the money uh, over a period of time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I um, attended the New River Valley Community Services Board meeting and sort of in the same vein, they, they did have a really good report on the Radford Transit um, and what was going on with their program and how much it's grown. And it's sort of like the same thing as the Blacksburg Transit and that some of its funding, they're gonna be competing for the funding that's involved with this whole MPO thing because now they're included and they've got to compete against each other for for monies, which is sad. But anyway, they sound like they're really making a lot of progress with their uh, transit and it's particularly of value to people that are, are trying to get from place to place that might be served by the New River um, Valley Community Services um, uh, services. Uh, they've expanded some positions um, and these positions mainly are going, this this goes back to the New River Valley Community Services Board. These are like in school counselor positions that are going to be expanded over into the Giles County area. We have them in Montgomery, we have them in Pulaski and they're going to expand some in Giles and I think every school in Floyd is covered but one. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, why would they be expanding personnel when they just cut personnel? Well, the personnel that they're expanding in this case are personnel that are going to be bringing in money based on what they do. So that was, uh, that was information that we were given. Also, I'm going to hand to you, um, we have these flyers. And um, this is a, some workshops that will take place this Thursday. There's a session one and a session two. Uh, would you like to learn how you can help support wellness in our community? And it's called, it's about mental, mental first aid. And it's interesting because it did state that a person is more likely to experience a mental health crisis than a heart attack. And so if you're interested in, in finding out about what is mental health first aid, that's going to be the first session that starts at 9 a.m. at the Lyric on Thursday. Session two will start at 11 a.m. till noon. And it's, it's going to be all about self-directed health management, wellness, and recovery. And attendance is free. You just have to pre-register and you get a free breakfast. So if anybody's available, it might be something that would be sort of neat to go to and find out about. Um, the other thing I wanted, oh, I forgot that um, we never did say why Matt Gabriel, Gabriel isn't here tonight. Um, it's because he's at a... Um, function for his son at a Cub Scout end of year picnic and he would probably want you all to know that. The other thing that I want to know and I don't know how we get this information is when the bridge fell apart out west started me thinking about the bridges that we have that go through our county how many of those bridges are like on any kind of list that's like a danger list and I know that we don't have you know, resources to go out and fix bridges, but it would be a shame if something happened in our own community and we weren't even aware a bridge was on a list. If we're aware that a bridge is on a list, can't we make our representatives aware that we want something done about it? Murray, I can't think of exact, something happened about a bridge and VDOT had all the bridges. You remember, the, it ain't been too long ago? Uh, they had, I think the bridge in Narrows was their number one priority, which had the lowest rating in the New River Valley, and that yeah. is in the process of being replaced. I remember reading that study. Uh, yeah. I don't remember. They do have a condition report or a condition assessment of all the bridges. I don't know. I know it's been since I've been on this board. Well, so can I get a copy been, of it? Yeah, I guess VDOT would, would probably, I think they're engineers or something. Something that happened with the bridge. Oh, the bridge out west somewhere that collapsed with all the people and it raised awareness in Virginia and they went out and inspected all the bridges throughout the Commonwealth. They'd probably have to shut the interstate down if they fix them up. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't have enough money. They don't have enough money either. That's mm -hmm. a big problem. But they rated them some way yeah. as well, far as replacing them. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah, well, it just goes with the whole infrastructure, you know, problem across the nation. But it would be interesting to be aware of our own circumstances because it is something we can ask our elected representatives about. Um, 
you know, we have plenty of money to send overseas to fix things, but it seems like, you know, when you have people falling in rivers and things because a truck hits a bridge in the wrong place, that it sort of doesn't make too much sense to me. But anyway, I would like to know. So that's it. Supervisor Tuck. Three things. Uh, the first is I was sitting at a stoplight and I noticed all the, the Tea Party license plate tags and how it's got live free or die in their eye catch. And I was on the way with my son. He was driving to take me to school. And I started thinking, what if we came up with a plan here in Montgomery County to use freedom increases responsibility? Now, each one of those tags generates a certain amount of money for whatever charity is involved. And we give every single dollar of that towards the school board's budget. And we come up with a, a creative way of whether it's got to be eye-catching because more people are going to want to have it if it looks good. And whether we use the seal, whether we use maybe the logos from some of our various high schools, but to then be able to turn over those funds, 100% of them, towards the, the county schools. And so I would like to see if we couldn't ask the staff to at least look into that. Uh, when you look at some of the tags, some of them cost us you know, an extra $25 to have those mm -hmm. custom type tags. And a, a great deal, Virginia Tech does it, Radford University does it. Uh, there's all sorts of groups that throughout uh, the state of Virginia. I actually know some information on that because when I was the city manager in Bedford, we worked to get a tag for the National D-Day Memorial. You have to have a petition signed by 300 right. citizens who indicate, and I'm not sure, I don't think you have to prepay, but basically it's 300, 300 that commit to buying them before they'll do and, any of them. And if you start looking at 300 times 25, that's, some, that's a, a, at least a, a decent amount of money. So I'd like to at least... You know, we keep thinking of creative ways to generate. Well, this is something that we might be able to do. The second thing, and similar to along those lines, I would like, you know, we have an Eastern Montgomery High School uh, that encompasses Shawsville, Elliston, Lafayette. Um, and we're in the process of building a new high school on the western side uh, of our county. And so I would like to do something, maybe at least talk with the school board, not saying that we do it, but at least discuss this matter with the school board to see if this is something that they may be interested in that would embrace the diversity of that entire area of the county. Prices Fork, Longshot, McCoy, Wake Forest, Merrimack, Tom's Creek, and Whitethorn, and maybe name it, whether it be Northwestern Montgomery County High School, whether it be named Western Montgomery High School, but at least to discuss it with the school board and maybe to authorize Craig uh, to talk with Brenda to see if that's something that the school board would be interested in. There might be some needs for some additional funds uh, possibly to address that, but I, I think it would be an idea that we could at least discuss about making our schools a little more diverse in the, their names. And so I would put that out as a motion at this point in time to authorize Craig just to discuss it with Brenda. I will second that, that motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? So are we going to do that for Christiansburg and Auburn and change their names too? Well, I wouldn't, you know, if we get one Auburn, I was thinking about that. That kind of it doesn't, it's just not Reiner High School. It's Auburn. It embraces a, a large area uh, that, that deals with that area of the county. If Christiansburg, once we start looking at um, a, a new high school or remodeling it, that's when we could start looking at that idea, maybe going with the Central Montgomery High School. Uh, but just take a look at it. But it, right now we've got uh, the opportunity, I think, to at least discuss it with the school board and see if that's something that they're interested in doing. I don't see where it, it, it would hurt to discuss it and, and uh, you know, to put it out there. And it, it I mean, if uh, the manager and the superintendent and and whatever talk about it and it's no 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 at least you know it was looked at yeah any other comments are you voting on this thing now or? I I think you got a motion in a second yeah okay. okay no further comments roll call please mr curry aye miss perkins no mr brown aye miss biggs I'm going to vote now, and I would like to, it noted that I believe that there is quite a bit of history to Blacksburg High School, and um, this is something that I've been through this kind of thing before, 
within our county when names have come up for schools and it's not something that I would probably vote on just out of the spur of the moment at a meeting like this um, and it is the school board's prerogative to name the schools and just knowing my community because I represent District F and I know that there that the people that live within my community identify Blacksburg High School as Blacksburg High School at this point in time. And until my community tells me differently, then I'm supporting my community. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Chair Boyles? Aye. Four eyes, two no. The, the last thing I have to discuss is for many years, I, I donated blood about 10 years ago, and I don't particularly like needles. I, don't, I kept finding excuses and excuses and excuses. Um, and, and today I donated blood. I'm able to work. All those excuses that I had uh, are gone away. But they, they told me an important thing when they were drawing blood, that if for men, if you will donate blood once a year, you reduce your heart attack by 50, the chances of a heart attack by 50%. So instead of being a chicken, like I had been for the past 10 years, go out and not just do something for your community by donating blood, but do something for yourself just once a year. That'll be it. All right. And uh, I have a couple things. Uh, the first thing is here, I need to clarify a little further why I had to abstain. And uh, the reason on the uh, restaurant boat, is uh, participating in the voting. Um, yeah. Marty, I'm having a hard time reading you right here, but I'll, I'll try to get through it. Uh, uh, I think the, the code requires you to, to state what your conflict is. OK, my is conflict. More, more general, so yeah. Why you recused yourself from participating in the Okay. The reason I had to recuse myself from participating in the voting was due to a business relationship that I have with the restaurant owner. And uh, okay. that's, that's okay. the other thing I had uh, a week ago last Friday, I was in the penitentiary. You got out quick, didn't you? I got out. I got a good lawyer. <laughs> but uh, I was invited. I'm on the uh, Virginia Cares board, and I'm also on the Governor's Reentry Council. And the reason I was over there, I was invited by our probation department to take a tour of the prison over in Bland and to attend a uh, work fair day. And uh, one of the interesting things is they're trying to, to prepare these folks. Most of them would be released in the next three to four months to reenter the community. And uh, it, it was just quite an experience to talk to several of them and see how anxious they are to get out, but how f much fear it is to be re reintroduced to something some of them didn't even know about. Uh, I can't say they didn't know about the internet, but they hadn't used it for many years since all the upgrades, things like Facebook and things like that. So being on the reentry council, one of our, one of my functions is to help people find jobs not, not me personally, but the staff, uh, help people find jobs, help them uh, find a place to live, and things of this nature. And uh, this is, as everybody knows, a continuing cycle. And it's something that uh, I'm proud to be part of. So I just wanted to mention that as one of the things that I do in my off time. <laughs> but uh, and next week, Mr. Creed, I'm going to be in Richmond on Monday for the AG meeting, uh, so I won't possibly I won't be at the PSA meeting on Monday night. If I get back early enough, I will. And also on 
Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I'm going to be at Virginia Care State Board meeting you know, over in Virginia Beach. But I won't be able to enjoy too much of it. So. <laughs> Jim, to provide a little more information to Ms. Biggs about the funding, um, they, it's a six-year program that's very similar to what we have in Virginia. Uh, they estimate that there'll be a total of 28 million or 28.2 million over the next six years. And part of it says, uh, uh, or part of it, com the Commonwealth Transportation Board provides the local matches for the, what we call the RACP funds, which happen to be the Regional Service Surface Transportation, Transportation. Program. And so there are some uh, local funds that have to be um, matched with this. Uh, also, it says that um, the RSTP program uh, that receives the, um, the, mo the money has 12 months to obligate the funds and 36 months to expend the funds. That's a good three years after they are obligated. And then more um, particularly, when it came to the Ellison Intermodal Facility, we had this. The project budget uh, has been listed as $36.1 million. Um, and the project timeline, now this is the whole thing, originally, the project timeline currently is on hold as Norfolk Southern assesses current market demand for the Heartland Corridor. And also the project scope was to involve the intermodal facility, the rail yard, and the connector roadway. And it's my understanding from what I've read um, and looking at the information I've been given that the road is uh, underway and that they are, uh, that BDOT will be widening and dealing with 603 from 81 to 460. That's correct. As it now stands. So it's um, what's called the Regional Surface Transportation Program. They're mostly federal, it's federal highway funds, just like when we're doing things at the airport for the airport authority. The federal government, the Federal Aviation Commission gives 95% uh, of the funds. The state of Virginia gives 3% and the 2% is then left to the well, locality. You know, I was just wondering if, if our county was going to have to pay money to a study no. to advocate for something that we had gone no, through such no, a hard time that's about. What, well, I didn't vote for it anyway, so right. <laughs> that's one of those things. Let, let me say one, one other thing real quick. If any of you ever get a chance, Salem on the, what I call the River Road, that runs Riverside Drive. Riverside, Riverside Drive. Drive. If you want to see a nice bicycle, pedestrian walkway, go go there and yeah, just yeah. drive down through, go that way. They're beautiful the down way. there. I mean, they, they've done it the way it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no further business, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I don't think there's any other